now we're recording. The, the one other kind of prior information that you have is, is the slightly secondary, but it's related to this example. So if you had a jar of pennies and you picked only one of them out of the jar and you started tossing it, then the, the logic that we just went through would apply. You, you pick a penny at random, you toss it, and um, you get zero out of two heads and your probability of heads is still going to be close to a half based on what most people would choose. But if somebody told you that that, that population of pennies in the jar was constructed so that three fourths of those pennies were biased and one fourth of them were regular unbiased coins. So now you have new information. The information doesn't apply to any one coin but it applies to the, the whole set of coins in tendency. So if you knew that three quarters of the coins were biased, you don't know if the one you picked is biased or not, but then you start flipping it. So you would use the 0.75 in your prior uh, to, um, and if, especially if you knew which direction it was biased, like more heads than tails, that 0.75 becomes a formal part of your prior and uh, a frequentist, if you told the frequentist that the, the, this, the whole population of coins is 0.75 probability or 0.75 of them are biased uh, and now start flipping the coin and getting a confidence interval for the probability of heads, the frequentist would have no way of using that 0.75 number. Whereas the Bayesian approach gives you a very, very natural way to use that 0.75. Very helpful, thank you. Sure. Anybody have any general statistics questions or, or ones about uh, study design or Bayes? Uh, I, there's always a lot of measurement issues that we forget to talk about and I, the more I work with, researchers in the field, uh, including uh, a, a conference I had yesterday, uh, measurement is so important and, and um, there's a lot of uh, lack of attention of getting the best measurements for a study and it has such a huge impact. Um, and also, uh, if, you, if you get measurements that are biased and so we had a great example uh, where there was um, that, that drug that was just uh, fast-tracked from Gilead for um, COVID-19. It's, it's not remisivir, but it's a name like that. Somebody knows the right name of it. Um, starts with an R and it has vir at the end. Um, and so there was a study that was uh, just released that made, um, made the study be stopped in favor of efficacy, but there was a previous study just published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they had not such a good, strong uh, randomized clinical trial design. And they claimed, uh, and this was under the Compassionate Use Program with FDA, uh, and they claimed that the drug was beneficial in treating COVID-19 patients, uh, but they made a fundamental uh, mistake and now there's uh, letters to the editor to an England journal and the authors are not admitting the mistake really, which is what usually happens. A lot of Twitter activity about it yesterday and today uh, because what they, they did is they took an ordinal outcome and they made it into a binary outcome, which is your first clue that something bad is about to happen. But they sort of took it one step farther where they, instead of saying time until something bad happens, they did their, their time is time until something good happens and then it's uh, something good is just a binary event. So it's time to event data uh, with a binary event which has about the same power as just using a binary event unless there's very little censoring. But the mistake was if, if you're recording time until the patient gets better and they died, uh, that means at, at the time of last, last observation the patient did not get better and so they record that as a censored point. So if somebody is, is not contacted, uh, if somebody dies on day five, uh, 
they haven't gotten better by day five. So they would count it as censored at five plus. And so, uh, in other words, they didn't count death as something very bad happening to you. And the statistical mistake uh, is that when you're uh, looking at censored data, the censoring event has to be a random event. So what makes you censored would be um, if you entered the study late and you've only had 20 days of follow-up where somebody that entered the study early had 60 days of follow-up, you're gonna be censored at 20 days just because you enrolled late in the study. So that's called administrative censoring and, and it's a completely random event uh, for our purposes. Uh, but if you censor somebody because they died, the, the censoring event is not a random event. And so you're violating a key uh, assumption of the Kaplan-Meier estimate and, and most of the survival analysis methods where censoring has to be independent of the impending risk. And so they violated that assumption and they didn't use a competing risk analysis. So that's a case where they, they made the endpoint have low power by making the event binary instead of ordinal, but then they used censoring improperly and they treated death as something that's not so bad, it just censors, which violates a key assumption. So that's, I think, is a good example of how you can go, you can get into trouble on two different counts. Juan, you had a question or a comment? I think you're muted right now. No, yes. you're, you're, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. What what will be the let's let's imagine that this New England trial was a randomized control trial, double blind, comparing remdesivir with placebo. Will that the the effect of this mistake will be the same? Because then, if you analyze, uh, let's say, with Cox proportional hazard model, the 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 specific hazard for improvement and the specific hazard for death, will that be a problem? Yes, that'll be a big problem. And so in that regard, it doesn't matter whether it's randomized or not. You know, not being randomized has different issues, but the analytical problem remains the same. So you're, you're violating the independence of the censoring event and the outcome event. Uh, so yeah, so randomization would not protect you at all for that. Uh, you can do a competing risk analysis, which will give you the right cumulative incidence of the non-death event accounting for death, but it's still, uh, so if you use the Cox model, you can get hazard ratios okay without doing anything fancy in some cases, but you cannot convert the Cox model to a cumulative incidence estimate without explicitly taking into account competing risk. Even if you take into account competing risk, I think the result is hard to interpret because you're saying um, the probability of, event, of an event happening is P, and if death interrupts the event, that probability of the event happening is gonna be lower. So that you're calculating the cumulative incidence, allowing death to interrupt the process and make the event lower. So the, the classic example, you have uh, patients who die of heart attack can't develop cancer. And so the cancer incidence goes down if you have a high heart attack rate. And, and that is a correct estimate. But the interpretation of it is still really, really difficult. And so I would rather have an endpoint that gives you penalty for heart attack and cancer and not have to talk about the competition. Juan, you had another comment? Uh, yes, but uh, you know, you say that you can get the hazard ratio right, and in a randomized trial, you have taught us that what you are looking at, at, at are relative effects, and uh, it's less relevant what will be the absolute cumulative incidence of the event uh, within each group. You are interested in comparing the two groups. Yeah, and let me let me correct something that I said. If if censoring is independent the regular hazard ratio that sensors on the other event is correct. But if the centering is not independent, uh, let's say somebody dies of a heart attack because their cancer got worse and you didn't know it. So if you're doing a competing risk analysis, you're gonna, you're gonna mess up the competing risk analysis with that setup. So even to get the hazard ratio with a regular Cox model assumes independent centering. 
but uh, independent censoring does not go far enough to give you the right cumulative incidence estimate. You have to use competing risk methods. Uh, so it's it's actually a I've been trying to understand competing risk for 20 years, and to me, it's very difficult to understand. I would rather calculate a probability that I can tell you exactly what it means. So if I were to tell you that I'm going to calculate the probability of your having a stroke or dying, I can tell you exactly what that means. If I calculate a probability of stroke, uh, without saying or dying, I have a lot of trouble telling you exactly what that means. So I, I really favor taking any event and pooling that with anything worse than that, because I can calculate and interpret the probability of something or worse. What's the probability of stroke or dying? I know how to calculate that. I know how to interpret it. So you can see the issues get very sticky very fast. And I, this is one reason that in the COVID-19 trials, we're pushing longitudinal ordinal outcomes, which I've been trying to push in cardiovascular trials for a long time, but we didn't have the right methodology. Now we're getting closer. And if you just say in any time interval, what's the probability of something bad happening to the patient? That's a pretty simple concept. And it applies to a lot of situations and not just clinical trials. Hi, this is Georgette Asherman. I, I work in cellular therapy at, at Bristol Myers Squibb now. And I have a question about experimental design in general, because we do a lot of experiments that we can't, uh, they're, they're very expensive and they can't be fully, I guess, full factorial with reps like you do in standard experimental design. Uh, and then we say, oh, these are confounded. These effects are confounded. Can, can Bayesian priors help in those situations? I, I don't think uh, it can help in any, in any easy way. I think uh, where Bayesian helps you is when you have uncertainties that you can that you know what you're uncertain about and you can write them down as a mathematical model. So I was on a conference yesterday where somebody's des designing a new COVID-19 trial and uh, you want to enroll people that actually have the virus, but the test takes a, a bit of time to come back. So they have to randomize people before they know that they really have the virus before the test is positive comes back. And so they devised a Bayesian plan to account for the uncertainty of the diagnosis. Most people take the diagnosis as a given um, enrollment criterion, uh, but they were taking the uncertainty of the diagnosis into effect in a very formal way with a Bayesian model, which is really cool. So I don't know if that sa same logic applies to your situation, but you could um, you can essentially have um, uh, something like uh, a confounder variable, but you could have uncertainty on, about whether it is a confounder variable. So you, if, you, if you were really good about writing down a model, which is very challenging for this case, and the model had in it the probability that this is a confounder because uh, you're not certain about it, uh, then the Bayesian final result would take that uncertainty into account in a very elegant way. So it's all a function of being able to model that um, and uh, be very explicit. And, and you can also look at how Bayesian methods handle missing data, which is, and how Bayesian handles measurement error. So in the book by Richard McElroy, Statistical Rethinking, uh, second edition, just like in the first edition, he talks about measurement error and how to explicitly take that into account with Bayesian methods. So that has a little bit to do with your question. But I think in general, if you don't have con total control in your experimental design, uh, you're, you're, in, you're in hot water. And so that's why in industry, when you can, you do factorial designs. And factorial designs, as I've said many times, you could have uh, a two to the fifth factorial design, 
with 32 parameters on 36 mice. And that's because the control is so fantastic and the factors are all 100% uncorrelated with each other. It's an orthogonal design. So when you design something to be, so that the factors are truly independent of each other and they're statistically perfectly uncorrelated with each other in the five factors you're putting in the factorial design, you have ability to do things that, that we don't even entertain in our wildest dreams in, in most clinical research and certainly in epidemiologic research. Well, I mean, this is situations where we, we can't even, you know, it's like machine, we, we have machines, we know they have variability, we've tested them before, but you can't, you can only use them once a day, let's say. So, and you can only have two days to do something. So, I mean, we, we have these fractional factorials that aren't really even like designed as fractional factorials. It's really becomes an issue. And so we have the information, but I'm, I mean, I, I'm, it's not really something that comes into the literature and the people, you know, that you see in typical like experimental design books. So, yeah they feel like, oh, it's, it's automatically confounded. And I, and I don't really think of it that way because it, it, we know about the variability in, in some of the things we're doing because we do a lot of, um, you know, I guess validation testing and things like that on these machines and on these processes. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of considerations with regard to machines and processes that you know, there's a whole sec huge section of FDA that deals with that and several of the statisticians specialize in that because they have to deal with things like batch effects in looking at uh, drug uh, quality. And then how much sampling do you do to find out there's a batch effect and then what do you do about it? So there are people that deal with messy things remotely like what you're saying. I'm not one of those. I've never had any experience with that, but it sounds like it can get pretty tricky. Now, what was the name? Richard McKel McKelvey? McKelreath, yeah. Cap McKel M C M C capital E-L-R-E-A-T-H. So that is, that is one of the most uh, intuitive books in uh, science uh, that I've, I've ever heard okay. of. And it really makes it natural to talk about things like missing data and measurement errors uh, whereas the frequentist world has some problems dealing with those things and they have problems being explicit about it in many cases. There's a lot of methods for measurement error in the, in the frequentist world, but I think the Bayesian thinking about it is more clear. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's a story I like to tell that that points out the value of uh, having the highest quality data. So you, everybody knows about the history of nutritional epidemiology and how we're left with a lot of confusion about whether a food is good for you or bad for you. And every other week, there's a paper still coming out says one week coffee is bad for you and the next week is good for you. So, um, and a lot of uncertainty about alcohol, but every, every kind of food. And so um, there's, there's measurement errors because people, you're asking them people to report what they eat and they lie about it. They just are very, very, very inaccurate. And then even if they were accurate, you have a lot of confounding because what makes somebody take certain dietary supplements is they have the money that allows them to buy the supplements, uh, which means they may have, they have money for healthcare. So you have confounding. So, um, there was a study that came out in one of the big medical journals like New England Journal of Medicine about six years ago. I think they randomized uh, 24 patients uh, in a crossover study and they put them in a metabolic chamber for one week. They controlled everything they ate. Uh, of course, they controlled the environment and they had exact measurements of the met metabolic rate oxygen consumption and so on of the people in the metabolic chamber. And so with that crossover study with about 26, 24 uh, subjects in it, they were able to find out very precisely how what you eat matters in terms of how, how do you metabolize certain things according to what type of carbohydrate you ate and all of these things. So what they learned from those a couple of dozen subjects 
was greater than what you would learn from a 40,000 subject uh, epidemiologic study in, in nutrition. It's just an, it's an amazing example of what scientific control and precise measurement can do. Anybody got an easy issue to bring up? These are these are tough ones. Hi, Frank. Here's Andre from Brazil. Hi, Andre. How are you? Good. How are things there? We 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 heard some news today that wasn't quite so good about the death yeah. rate. Uh, here where I live, things are still pretty good. good. Brazil's a continental country, so we have a lot of variation. Here, I'm in the extreme south, so here it's okay. But in the north, things are really chaotic. Mm. Not enough coffins for everyone, and Oof. ICU is completely packed. So, well, Sorry to are... hear that, and good luck. Thanks. <laughs> so my question is... One thing I really learned from you is to try to use the most information as possible. So not use binary outcomes, try to use continuous or ordinal outcomes. And my question would be, in that study you mentioned, the New England Journal of Remdesivir, one thing they did wrong was to use a binary outcome, like death or no death. So it would be better to use an ordinal outcome. But the other thing that I think they did right was to use time until the outcome instead of just it happened, yes or no. So my question is, how do you use both? Like time until something, but this being an ordinal outcome and not a binary outcome. I'm not sure right. if I was clear. That raises some fantastic issues. So thanks, Andre. Uh, so the first one is the simple part, which is if you had a time to event outcome, let's say it's time until death and you followed everybody a hundred years. So you're going to have everybody died and your time until death is going to be measured very accurately. And your, your effective sample size is the number of people. So measuring time until death when everybody died is the same as measuring blood pressure at one point in Did Frank's screen freeze or it's just for me? Yeah. Yeah, this has happened before. He'll, he'll come back, I think. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, can you hear me again? Yes. I, I have yes. A, a wonderful router, but uh, it, it, it blinks like once a week. And I don't know why it does that. Uh, anyway, sorry about the interruption. So the, if you had only one-tenth of the subjects suffer the event, uh, the power of the Cox proportional hazards model for hazard ratio testing for time to event is about the same as a power of a proportion. So the, the more censoring you have, the, the less it matters when people had the event. So this is not really well appreciated. So it, it becomes like a dichotomous variable. So there's, uh, so time to event is, is a nice way to analyze data, but it, it, it only has great power relative to a continuous variable if, if you have a high proportion of people having the event, you know, like over 0.6 or something like that, but it's all relative. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, and if you have order, ordinal outcome, you can do a lot better than that. So uh, 
there's two, there's at least two major, there's three major approaches to dealing with using more information that I can think of. So the one is state transition models, which are, the, which is the most general of all methods. And the problem, the reason we don't do state transition models is that they have too many parameters because you have all kinds of state transitions. If you have a five ordinal variable, you know, you could have like 25 types of state transitions. And so there's too many parameters. You can lose power just from that. And then there is uh, longitudinal ordinal outcomes, which is what we're concentrating on for COVID-19. And then there is the third way is a special case that Berridge and Whitehead published uh, around 1990, where they had a uh, time until the event and the severity of the event when it happens. And they, they showed how to do a hazard function that, that is like the product of two hazard functions. So there's a hazard function for death, uh, there's a hazard function for the event, and there's a hazard function for the severity of the event once it happens. And so the severity of the event was was using a discrete proportional hazards model, which is the continuation ratio ordinal logistic model. So this applies, and their example was you're treating migraine headache. So in migraine headache, you, you're trying to, to uh, prevent the headache with a drug. And then if the headache comes, you're like, you would like it to be not severe. So you might measure the severity of the headache on a one to four scale and then you have time until the first headache after the drug started being taken as your other part of your outcome. And so they developed a joint model for those two things. Now that it still loses a bit of power because you you have two treatment parameters. You have the treatment parameter for timing and a separate treatment parameter for the severity of the event, but it's a really cool idea. But you can see that that applies to migraine headache, but doesn't apply to things where the severity can be measured before the event, before the terminal event. So if, if you're measuring severity of a patient every day, like do they need to be on a ventilator? And if they need to be on a ventilator, do they need to be on an invasive ventilator or a non-invasive ventilator? So there's different levels of lung failure that would make you need that. And then you have, you have death, or, or you could have a coma, you could have other states, but let's say death is the next state. So you're measuring the severity of the patient's outcome every day. And then when they die, they're, they're stopped from the study. Um, and so that the method of Barrage and Whitehead would not apply because you have, a, you have repeated ordinal and not just an uh, ordinal at the time of the event. So there are several options out there. Thanks, Frank. Sure, yeah, it's a great question. And, um, and there's another uh, example that kind of brings some light to this is I work mainly in cardiovascular studies and the typical cardiovascular study is between 6,000 and 10,000 patients. And one of the reasons it's so large is because it's a common disease. So, you know, you don't have that much trouble randomizing people, but it's very expensive. So why does it take between 6,000 and 10,000 patients to do a cardiovascular phase three trial? And the reason is you need about 600 events to have a, have great power to detect at least a 15% reduction in the hazard of an event. So how you achieve 600 events can happen from long follow of, of fewer patients or shorter follow up of more patients. It doesn't matter how you get there, but you need, you need 600 to 800 events. So if you need 600 to 800 events in cardiology, why do you not need 600 to 800 events in cancer? Well, the answer is you do need it, it's just nobody's willing to admit it. So they'll say, we want to have power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.5. We want to have the power to detect a miracle chemotherapy that never happens. And so they'll get the study off the ground and then they'll wonder why the study is not informative at the end. There's no wonder about it. It's, there's no mystery at all. But uh, I think the way cardiovascular trials are designed points out the cost of using a binary endpoint. If you had 6,000 patients, 600 had the event, your, your endpoint is mainly just binary. And so you're gonna have low power. And so you've chosen a low information event 
if you could do something, and there's a lot of controversy about this, but if you could measure your heart function, let's say your left ventricular ejection fraction is a great measure of heart function for the main pumping part of the heart, uh, that would be a fantastic thing to measure. And then at death, your heart function goes to zero. So you've got the measurement there. Um, and so the, the sample size needed for, to, for a variable like that, instead of being 6,000 patients, it might be uh, 250, 300, 400. It, it makes an unbelievably big difference in terms of cost and time duration of the study. You get into a lot of discussion about um, surrogate endpoints, though. People are always criticizing if you don't have death or some really strong endpoint, uh, how do you know that you've learned about what really matters to patients? Yeah, so in this case, if, if we're going to use left ventricular ejection fraction as an endpoint, I can understand if someone dies, you just say, well, the ejection fraction is zero, but what if they have a stroke, for instance? Can you model that too, or you would have to ignore that in, in this exact modeling? That's a, another great question. So you, I don't ever want to ignore something as important as stroke. So stroke might not change your ejection fraction, but it could be an overriding event. So it could be, it could be counted as even worse than a big heart attack if it's a debilitating stroke, you know, if it's one where you lose function permanently. So your stroke could be equivalent to like an ejection fraction of one, and then you have regular ejection fraction. It doesn't, you don't need to decide what number to place it. You just need an ordinal scale that says stroke is worse than any, than any non-stroke outcome. If that's the case, then you know where to put it on the ordinal scale and death would be worse than that. The, the amazing thing that that would accomplish, and I've been pushing cardiologists in this direction for some time, and they're not ready to bite yet, uh, is they, they never solve the problem of diagnosing heart attacks. Everybody thinks a heart attack is very easy to diagnose. It's really not. And what's really not easy is to say there's small heart attacks and there's big heart attacks. So a, a 60 year old man that has a small heart attack is is at no more risk than like the general population of 60 year old men. Uh, so the, the extent of the heart attack matters. So if you ask them, how do you measure the extent of the heart attack so you can really get a more powerful outcome? They will say, well, we're gonna use an assay level like uh, high sensitivity troponin. And then you say, well, how do you translate that to an outcome variable to grade the, the extent of the infarct? And nobody in the world knows how to do it. And every lab has different calibration of the assay. And so when you got data coming in from different labs, uh, you don't really know how to combine it. Nobody solved that problem yet. If you measured at the time of the infarct, if you said, we're going to force you to get your left ventricular ejection fraction measured on the day of the infarct or the next day, you're going to have a wonderful measure of the severity and extent of the infarct. And now you've got a way to grade it. And if it's a very small infarct, you're not going to count it nearly as much as a big heart attack. So uh, I think we could do a lot better in terms of grading severity of, of endpoints. There was a paper that that uh, a statistician I've always revered, Stephen Sin, who's the world's greatest statistician in pharmaceutical research. Um, he, wrote, he wrote this amazing book, Statistical Issues in Drug Development, which is great. But he wrote a paper in Statistics and Medicine oh, about maybe eight years ago about the importance of statisticians getting involved in measurement and refining measurements. And he had statisticians write letters to the editor saying that's an improper paper. Statisticians have no purview in the measurement process. That's not part of their job description. And I was, I was in a state of shock 
over statisticians actually writing letters to the editor like that. So I've always put it directly in my purview. And I, I see most statisticians when they're in a meeting with collaborators, the statisticians are right in assuming they don't understand the subject like your collaborators that specialize in the subject. But the statisticians are dead wrong in saying that their role is to be silent when any measurement issues are discussed. And I'll see a lot of them not enter into the discussion. This is a real tragic because we have a lot to offer. And I've been involved in so many clinical trials that are futile because the measurement of the main outcome variable was uh, problematic or especially because it had low power. On the topic of challenging outcome variables, Dr. Harrell, uh, can, would you be able to talk a little bit about uh, risk models with Poisson distributions, such as is typically used in uh, pharma pharmaceutical safety studies and epidemiology studies? One of the challenges, or there are two challenges that frequently um, come up, or three, there are many, but Let's pick three. One are non-constant rates. The other is the, the desire to use multiple events for individuals and the non-independence associated with that. Um, you, can you recommend, can you, do you have a philosophy and then can you recommend best resources for dealing with the issues and do any of your materials address rate models in particular? I, I have I don't do anything to address rate models and I've never done a Poisson model in my entire career. I, somehow I've missed and I haven't had application for it. Um, because the times I've in, been involved in adverse events, it's more like zero one uh, stuff. But I, I have gotten interested in recurrent event methods for adverse events where you have the recurrent zero one sort, sort of thing. Now, when you mention rates vary and what are you mean, meaning by that, Drew? The, the Poisson assumption for the rate is that the rate is constant. Um, I, I think that's naive and wishful thinking, and, and I want to understand better how to um, handle the idea that, for instance, anaphylaxis, if you're treated with a drug, the risk of anaphylaxis is high initially and likely declines over time. The Poisson models assume a constant rate uh, within within intervals. And so I'm looking for best practices for handling what are expected to be non-constant rates over time in the course of follow-up. Okay, okay, that's great. So the, um, it gives me a chance to bring up uh, a slightly off topic thing, but then we'll get more to yours. So I see a lot of people using Poisson for things that, that it just doesn't work on at all, whether the rate's constant or not. So the example is um, patients are discharged from the hospital and you wanna measure uh, how many days they needed to spend in the hospital in the year after they were discharged. So did you keep them out of the hospital or are they frequent visitors back? And it may be that 90% of the patients who were in your study never came back to the hospital. So you have 90% of them at zero days. And then you have a small number at one day, two day, three days, and a very small number at 40 days in the hospital in the next 12 months. So you have zero inflation that's stunning and people try to do zero inflated Poisson, but you can't zero inflate the Poisson enough for 90% zeros. Uh, but if you think of that variable, not as a count, but you just think of it as an ordinal outcome uh, and use a semi-parametric model, semi-parametric model, allows for arbitrary clumping at zero and arbitrary ceiling effects also. So it, it doesn't assume any distribution for the number of days in the hospital in the next year. So I, I, I push semi-parametric models so hard that I can't get it out of my system and I'm pushing it in, in so many different contexts. Now in your particular question, I think that's a great setup for um, what would happen if you had an adverse event that can only occur once we know how to deal with the, the varying rate is you have a hazard model, for example, and the hazard function is 
is unspecified. So it's like a Cox proportional hazards model. It's, it's semi-parametric model. And, and so the hazard function doesn't, hasn't rate doesn't have to be anywhere near constant over time. And so how do you deal with it when the, the adverse event can be recurrent? Because you're, you're, are you, are you counting adverse events just over patients or within patients or both, Drew? The ambiguity around what incidence means is um, part of the challenge here when I work with the collaborators. Um, there, we are, people, are, the scientists are interested in first the time or the, or the risk of the first event of anaphylaxis. That's a subject, that's of importance. But anaphylaxis is also can be recurrent as continue within an individual as treatment continues. And so also of natural interest are, um, what is the, the risk uh, over time of recurrence or re multiple anaphylaxis events under, with continued treatment? And so that's sort of a different problem. Yes. So when you, uh, if you, if you only looked at time until the first one, then it's just standard time to event analysis. If you, if you're dealing with the recurrent events, there are a lot, there's a rich literature and I've collected a lot of papers in the literature and some files somewhere on recurrent events. And I do find it's a little bit hard to get my head around it. And I, I've been trying for a few years to put it in a context that to me is simpler to interpret. And I think that context is, is longitudinal ordinal data because you can also take into account the severity of the adverse event and not just the occurrence of it. But let's suppose it's just the occurrence. So what your data might look like is like 00010000. So you had two occurrences and let's say your time periods are one week long. So you have these one week time intervals and that you have longitudinal binary data. And this could be with a random effects model. It could have uh, a serial correlation built into it, just a little more complicated. Let's suppose you're doing a random effects uh, binary logistic model. So what you're calculating, and, and time is a fixed effect in the model. So time is handling your non-constant rate. So your probability of adverse event in week T is a logistic model that's a, fun a smooth function of T, it could be a spline function. And then it's a function of baseline characteristics. And so the probability of an adver adverse event at, at week T could go up and down over time. Usually goes down, like you said, uh, or, or it always goes up. It doesn't use, usually go up and down, but it, with this model, it could go up or down. And so your goal there is to estimate something efficiently and something you can explain to people. And so what you'd explain to them is, uh, as a function of weeks since randomization, uh, what is the probability of having that adverse event in that week? If it was ordinal, you would say, given the week, weeks since the drug initiation, what is the probability of having an event of level Y or worse on that week? So to me, rather than talking about the mean incidence function in recurrent events analysis, um, I would rather uh, talk about it as a longitudinal binary uh, outcome where I don't do any counting. I'm not counting events within person, uh, but it allows for multiple recurrent events because it's not an absorbing state. So this is depending on it not being an absorbing state to have that adverse event. So does that make sense that that, that would be competitive in terms of giving something interpretable? That's a very helpful reframing of the problem um, that gives us more options. I intuit that we could also um, serve the principal interest of characterizing or representing the, the problem, of characterizing or representing the, a rate until first occurrence and or a rate, a rate over time that varies over time, even with multiple events in, in, a, in a direct way. And then if you had uh, treatment by time interaction, you're allowing the probability of the adverse event, the shape of that effect over time to be different for placebo versus drug. Okay. 
So it's very, very hard. easy. It's it's like handling a time dependent covariate in a Cox model, but it's but it doesn't take any special likelihood other than handling uh, correlated longitudinal data. So it's just uh, it's just interacting a function of time with treatment with a with a typical interaction analysis. And it would handle censoring quite naturally. Yeah. The, now the censoring needs to be uh, needs to represent missing at random. Okay. So if, if you lose contact with someone, uh, the reason that you lost contact is not because of uh, them having a, a huge change in their risk that was not captured in the other variables you measured. Very helpful. Thank so you. So there's a missing at random assumption in, in almost all of our longitudinal models. And that's one reason I would like to count death as the ad, as an adverse event when it happens. I, so I'd like to say, what's your probability of adverse event or dying? Because then I don't have any any attempt at censoring due to death. Very helpful. Thank you. Okay. See if it see if it helps in actual practice. I've been wanting to see somebody actually try these methods. Anybody have any uh, questions about statistical estimates or tests or um, linear models or change scores? Change, that's, change scores is always a big topic. Okay, uh, I have one question. Sure. So you mentioned huge uh, clinical trials in cardiology. I'm hoping to to get into that in a couple of years. And one question I have regarding this and what you said about models right now is if you had to design a study, would you adjust for baseline covariates or you wouldn't have to because they were randomized. For instance, I saw a lot of people uh, like Steven Sands saying you should adjust for baseline covariates and for trial center, regardless of randomization. So I would like to hear your thoughts. And, and I, have, I have a little bit of an issue with adjusting for trial center, but mainly I see most clinical trials, they adjust for trial center and they don't adjust for age. And that's really, almost criminal negligence, because age will explain maybe a hundred times as much outcome variation as the clinical site will. So they're really adjusting for the wrong thing. So I think the, uh, the case for covert adjustment, first of all, anything Stevenson says, just do it. Don't, don't think about it too much, just do it. Uh, he's incredible. Uh, and I think the, the idea of not adjusting for easily explainable outcome variation is, is not, it's not even an ethical way to analyze data because by not adjusting for age and severity of disease and whatever else, you're requiring a significantly larger sample size, which means you're exposing more patients to the experimental arm just so that you can dumb down the analysis. So I'm very impatient with dumbing down analysis just so that you don't have to spend more time explaining it to someone. So if somebody says they want an analysis that any idiot can understand, I say, well, it may be that only idiots are going to be interested in, in your result. So uh, I, don't have, I don't have any abundance of patience on this particular topic. But there was a high-profile study that came out just uh, not many weeks ago on vitamin D therapy in patients. This is not COVID-19, but it's in patients with similar manifestation of, of uh, respiratory distress. And this study was so-called negative study. And um, it looks like uh, when we reanalyze the data that it might be a positive study when you adjust for covariates. And so the idea of not adjusting for covariate and losing the chance to find a treatment effect, just to make it simple, I just find that, that totally indefensible nowadays. So um, I can't imagine a reason under the sun for not adjusting for at least a couple of known important variables like age. Age is almost in, in, in adult studies, uh, especially if, it in, if your study includes a wide age range, age is almost, a, a, almost always a very important variable. 
So in the BVR notes that we haven't discussed on uh, uh, covert adjustment and randomized trials, uh, there's an example that shows what happens when you don't adjust for a dominating covariate. And, and the effective thing that happens is uh, you, you've got a hazard ratio for treatment A versus B. And the only way to interpret the hazard ratio is that you're comparing some of the younger patients on treatment A with some of the older patients on treatment B. Now that sounds like the opposite of what you would want a randomized trial to do, but that's exactly what it's doing. So there's no way to explain it. Uh, uh, you get a hazard ratio that's smaller than the adjusted hazard ratio. I mean, it's, it's closer to one. And there's no way to explain it without saying it's effectively allowing age to change as you go between treatment A and treatment B. And that's a very undesirable property that is, that, that of an unadjusted estimate due to what's called the non-collapsibility of the hazard ratio. What we want to do in a randomized trial is to say, if you were 50 years old and you got treatment A, here's what happened to you. And if you're 50 years old and got treatment B, here's what happened to you. So that is an estimate that's covert adjusted that will transport to other populations. Whereas the unadjusted estimate does not transport to other populations. If they have a different age mix, you'll get a different unadjusted estimate. And the more uh, wide the age distribution is, the more the hazard ratio will suffer being closer to one. So does, does that make sense? Does it sound convincing to you, Andre? Totally. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Yeah. If something's randomized, it's not a reason to dumb it down. It's a reason to still do your very best and to not sacrifice data that you collected. Uh, you have age and other variables on, on virtual, virtually everybody. It's like it's like free information. Well, I think we'll probably stop here. So if you have any other discussion to keep going, there's some topics already open on data methods related to some of our issues like endpoints, but new topics can always be created. And I think the, the endpoint discussion, uh, I'm glad it, we spent so much time on that because that, to me that is a little too neglected and it's, and it's all important. So. Please keep the discussions going and thanks for joining today. Look forward to a future time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrell. And everybody, please be safe and good luck in Brazil. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Harrell.